Uh, my name is John Lustig. Um, I'm originally from Chicago Heights, about 35 miles uh, east of, uh, of Lockport. Um, born and raised uh, my, my, uh, on my maternal side, uh, we are stewards of my, of my seventh generation family farm. We have one of the last family farms in Cook County. It, 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 I know that's hard to believe, but uh, we okay, we're along the Great Sauk Trail, and and that was one of my entry points into um, into preservation, conservation, um, the indigenous um, first First Nations as well as in, in, in my, my journey into, into the arts and art management. I, I tell the story all the time on my, I argued my thesis on my 29th birthday and I drove home to help bale some hay on, on my grandparents' farm. I threw out my back and I said, guys, that's it. I'm, uh, I'm, I, will, I will morph into administration, but my my farming, my my helping out on the family farm uh, is is days were over, but uh, it's it's our touchstone, and uh, it's it, it keeps us grounded. And and so to see what has happened and is continuing to happen along the canal, um, that awareness is is so important to me, and it's so crucial, uh, especially in the region where disinvestment has happened and and so now here we are in will county where we are investing and the stakeholders do have this long vision and this long awareness and so the building that we're in uh in in historic lockport the, the norton the norton granary is it's truly a privilege to oversee that site and and to be partners with uh with not only you all but the city and uh, to tell these to tell these stories, um, that's what brings us to this, to this exhibit, which um, is based out of the uh, originated from the old Joliet prison, which we can which we can touch on. Um, I can I can jump on if I'm going to try this one time and, and uh, see if I can. Do I have the share screen option, Aaron? Right. Should be at the bottom of your screen there. Yes, there we go. Yeah, let me pull my slides up. Bingo, here we are. Right. Do I have the screen? Do you have Do you have my screen? Uh, not quite yet. All right, how's that? Got my slideshow up. Oop. Uh, my bad, my bad. Let's see what I can back. I'm mean, back out. I'm. I, I love hiding behind the objects, folks. So let me uh, see if I can hide behind the. Ah, here we go. How's that? Are we? Are we live? I'm not seeing anything? Are we seeing me? It's seeing you. What? A fine thing. Yeah. Oh no. That's all right. Let's try this one more time. Uh, There we go. How's that? Fantastic. Ah, good. Yes. Thanks for your patience. So the exhibit, uh, oh, there we are. Thanks for your patience. So the exhibit is called Surplus Scrap. Um, we're all aware of, the, uh, of the, the Joliet prison, the original prison, and, and its abandonment or its decommissioning in 2002. Um, and there it sat, right? There it sat there on the, on the east side of, of Joliet. And what was fascinating for me or fascinating as, as we were able to get access was it had a life after it was decommissioned. Um, squatters, kids getting in there, uh, partying. Um, the prison is ubiquitous anywhere you go through and anywhere you go in the world it's 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 ubiquitous with the city of Joliet not not unlike uh, Chicago was uh, with uh, with Michael Jordan or before that Al Capone and and so on and so um, 
what was fascinating for me, and I and I actually postgraduate school, I taught in a in a Catholic school about three blocks from there, St. Thaddeus, which no longer is is operating. And so I would see that prison and and understanding the pop culture references, but then also seeing the shadow of it and how that impacts, how that must impact a community, uh, a decommissioned site and and what that represents not only from from the user end but the hist the historic end but then more importantly the the neighborhood and and the region um and then the, and then the fire then the fire occurred right in in 2015 and um and that was that the, the city of Joliet uh, uh went down to the previous uh, governor and, and said let's let's set up a relationship let's Let's demonstrate to you all um, that we can we can revitalize, we can reuse. Let's let's demonstrate a proof of concept. And so, the Juliet Area Hist Historic Museum, um, Greg Pierbolt and Quinn Adamowski, at the forefront of this in, in terms of getting access. Um, I was fortunate enough to get to get in early on to tour the site. And to 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 see to see what we saw was was really was shocking in a lot of ways, but in in in, in most underserved or abandoned sites, uh, from educational materials to evidence, uh, bloody clothing, and I, I mean uh, weapons. Um, it was it was it was stark, and so the stakeholders come in and, and and surround it. And next thing you know, things are appearing on eBay, right? And and uh, uh, I, I I try to get to Greg as quickly as possible and say, let's hey, let's try and slow this down. And and so a structure was formed, committees were formed um, as to how to utilize and clean up and make the site accessible. Obviously, the debate is going on in terms of the uh, the, the long term. Um, I have feelings on it. I'm sure everyone in this in this chat has feelings about uh, the the use of it. Um, but the first step for me was to see what was left from from the damage of the fire, and that was the first area that that they felt comfortable to go in and and extract um, the ruins. Um, and so Quinn, Quinn had the amazing idea of, of, of bringing in some artists, some local uh, and regional artists to say, hey, wait, what if there's something worth making out of this? And, and it grew very organically. Uh, the artist Sue Regis, uh, the glass artist, um, and, and had, a, had a posse, Aaron Blazer, who's a, who's a teacher in, in Tinley Park. And a lot of sweat equity, a lot of work gone, went in to start extra, extricating the trash, the ruins. Um, and so that's, that was the genesis for this exhibit. Uh, my, my point of entry was seeing it for, as, a, as, a, as a project, not only a, <laughs> a government excess in some way or government uh, uh, not taking care of their responsibility, which I, 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 I see that, but then the local the local overseeing to get in um, to try and reutilize and reimagine what this site can mean and what it could mean for the community. Um, the term, the, the title surplus scrap is the actual legal definition of, uh, of trash that the state of Illinois gives things. So um, in, in, in government parlance, we all have chain of custody on every piece of surplus property and it, it gets, everything gets tagged and bagged and, and moves around whether you're at a university or in a government office. And so to have this designation of it being surplus scrap means it's done, it's waste, it's gone. And for me, what better way to um, come up with a title? That, to me, that was the title for the exhibit. I like the alliteration. I, I, I like um, calling everyone out, so to speak, and um, and then the show started to happen. So there were there were two versions of the exhibit, um, and they 
as the prison was evolved and they were opening it up for tours and uh, in that in that venture they, they had a couple of breakout nights in the prison yard uh, bands and music and films and trying to use it as a multi-purpose space in order to, to bring attention to it and that's all great and um, um, but in, in a lot of ways it's unsettling <laughs> to be in that space and to think about the, the intent, the original intent of the space, but then to see how it was morphing. And for me, um, working with these artists and taking the remains and the trash and reimagining it and creating this body of work, um, to, me, to me was, was, uh, was the Phoenix, right? It was the Phoenix reemerging. And that's why I think this, this exhibit has carries a lot of a lot of meaning and a lot of weight um it, it it talks about issues of repurposing and recycling but also i think there are a lot of issues about social justice and awareness and, and uh, so this this first slide it, it is, a, is a combination piece or is a, is a collaboration piece between artist uh, sue regis and Dave Wheeler, Sue is a, is a glass blower. She has a studio in downtown Joliet, right around the corner from the Rialto Square Theater. And Dave Wheeler is a woodworker of, of really, really amazing stuff. And so, so what Sue did was gather up documents, right? Documents that were just lost in the fire, that were the scraps. And she embedded it, encased it in this, in this glass sphere and Dave, uh, Dave carved this uh, lovely little base for it. And in so many ways, it's it's one of the smallest pieces in the exhibit, but in, in so many ways, I think it, it, it signifies and, and captures what I think the idea is in terms of wanting to preserve and reimagine what that site can be. And, um, and I, and I just, I just love it. Um, and anyone feel free to, to type in a question or, or I know, I know Aaron will, will, will break in with my, with my stream of consciousness here. So the exhibit was also seen, uh, uh, Greg exhibited it at, at the Juliet Historic Museum. Uh, it had a really, it had a really nice run. It had a nice life. Um, I felt that the platform that we had, that we have in Lockport um, had, has an, another audience and another reach and we had a little more real estate to breathe for the for the objects to breathe and so i liked i always like to show candid shots so i so the uh the 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 uh the humans that are involved are always uh, willing to jump in and, and play just to give some scale for for the viewer so the object on the left is is one of wheeler's pieces of wood. Now, again, this, this wood was, was burnt, a burnt timber found in, in the site that, uh, you know, dating, if, if we're taking the prison all the way back to uh, 1848, right? Um, uh, this is, this is first, this is first generation good wood that doesn't, oh, that doesn't get, get, uh, get seen anymore. Uh, with just the, with the trees. And so he spins it on a lathe and just creates this amazing vessel. It's encased in, in some resin, but he also has other little pieces of wood dropped in as well as some barbed wire. Um, and that's the, that's the piece on the left. The piece on the right is just this amazing, again, gorgeous little chessboard that he created. And what I liked about it, when we talked to him about it, uh, I, I liked the idea of vertical chess. And so um, as we opened the exhibit, uh, and we were only, we only had the exhibit open for three weeks before the pandemic shut us down. Um, uh, so we were actually having people <laughs> playing chess, which was awesome, which was, which was amazing. So the chess pieces he gathered up on his own and, and everything else is just that, is that just that rich surface of that wood, which I, um, which I enjoy. And so I think there, there are also callbacks with the work in the exhibit to, um, to what the prison means and what the prison represents, uh, whether you're an inmate 
whether you're uh, a guard, whether you're part of the administration, whether you were an employee, whether you serviced it. And, and all of those things are being talked about now and, and the timing of where we are in terms of, of criminal justice reform and prison reform, uh, um, I really recommend people go take a look at what it was and, and, and how people were incarcerated. And it's pretty primitive uh, to go all the way up to 2002. I mean, um, it, it's, there, there were some pretty primitive conditions um, that, that existed on behalf of these inmates. And so, so the objects, I think, are embedded with that memory. Um, the, the pieces on the left, obviously, this uh, little melted television that the artist Terry Eastham claimed out of the wreckage. I, there's obviously some a wooden base as well. And then the, there's there's this pop culture aspect that that um, when when we when I first got back to town, um, when I first got to Lockport, and we got back here nine years ago. That was on my flight plan, or that was on my my drive, driving right past the prison every morning. And sure enough, at that front door, you would always see tourists out there getting <laughs> getting their photos taken, right, in that Blues Brothers pose. And so the prison obviously had already been abandoned in 2012, but they were doing film production, et cetera, and, and utilized that space. And obviously you know, the 1980 film here is still, uh, again, ubiquitous, right? It's, it's, in, it's, in the, it's in the psyche, it's in, it's in the collective consciousness of, of Americana. And so, the art, and so Terry basically, he cut out a silhouette of, of um, Jake and Elwood, and just set up a, a, a real simple screen and a, and, and a light, so it has a shimmering glow to it, um, and I think and, and it's charming. It's 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 on the on the nostalgic side, I would say, but as I when I talk to guests and when I talk to other uh, museumologists and and uh, why you, why do you feel you have to go that way? Um, I feel it's important to address all aspects of what that site and what the prison represents. And um, there is a cultural zeitgeist to it with, with the films and, 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 the, and the parodying. Um, so the photo on the right is just, again, we're, we were talking earlier about the bike tours uh, before we signed on. And I wanted to include this slide for you, Aaron, just to demonstrate and, and, and Anna, we get a lot of you get a lot of warrior weekend warrior traffic that just love to come down and explore and that's why I think the passport program is just a really exciting addition to the to the whole menu of opportunities and and uh, people stop in Lockport they park uh, they, they they love our site they get, little, they get some history they'll they'll grab a beer and then they'll continue on uh, south into or south and west into the uh so I, I like i like this group of ninjas that are, are posing with the uh, um uh, with terry's sculpture um it was really important this is thanks to greg excuse me to include some objects from from the site as well and um <clears throat> Nothing brings it home more than than to show the the, the ball and chains and and this this again was courtesy of, of the Joliet Historic Museum that they've they've had and they have had for a while and so a couple of the objects so uh, as we were doing our research these restraints were still being used not I mean restraints like this were still being used until 1948. Now, 1948 for some does, doesn't exist, right? When we when we talk to our younger our, our younger audience, but for a lot of us, uh, I mean, it's, it's 20 years before I was born, and and to think about that that these types of of restraints were still being used uh, post World War II is in some ways stunning and and shocking. Um, uh, each each ball weighs. 
40 pounds a piece and the shackles and the mannequins are, are and the, the, the shackles and the chains are right there to demonstrate it. I always like showing the tags. Uh, that's, that's another debated museum uh, methodology. But I like, I like showing those tags just to demonstrate that, that museums are stewards for these objects from this point forward. And I find that uh, important for the important for the viewer. And it, it, it's um, when you walk through the exhibit, uh, I, I like to, I like to think about it as in, enjoying or engaging in a, in, a, in a long meal. There are different courses. And, and so on one hand, we have a, a lean to, uh, to pop culture. And on the other hand, we have, a, we have a lean to the reality. And that's the journey that, and the narrative that I think is embedded in this exhibit uh, in order for all of us to remember and remind ourselves um, how we treat each other, uh, guilty and or innocent. Um, we're all we're all human beings on this on this uh, marble on this big blue marble. So I I wanted to show this. I, I I it's it's a stopper in 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 the exhibit for a lot of guests um, because of the reality of it. Right. We we all project our own biases and our own level of experience and expectations. Um, you know, when I'm a, when I was a child, you you would see you would see objects like this in cartoons, or you would see them on in Three Stooges shorts. And 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 today, here we are, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 years later, and 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 I think we've come to a greater understanding about the the uh, the lack of humanity that's that's uh, being expressed in in restraints like this. So. Um, um, Oh wow! Oh, so here's here's uh, Jeff here's Jeff Benedict's piece. Um, this is so there's there's three different angles here. So this, this the shot in the middle is how you approach the piece, and then the two shots on either side are, are angles to to get to get um, a, a perspective shot. Um, this was this is this was one of my least favorite objects because I had I had a lot of trouble wrestling with the concept of, of, again, the parody of the, of the animals being used. So the goat is the, is the figure on the right and the coyote, the, the goat skull and the, and the, the coyote skull is the, is the object represented on the left. And both were part of Jeff's, Jeff's world. And he's from Shanahan. So he, he lives out on the real estate. He's an iron worker by trade. He's a union iron worker. So Taking something like these barred-in walls, these barred-in windows, which was left behind, and working with his daughter, uh, his daughter Sophia, who at the time was 14, who did the stained glass backing, is really extraordinary. And there's some of her little cartoons are tucked in back behind the bars. But for me, I, I approach this, and I'm looking at it. And I'm saying, boy, how how is my how is the audience going to digest this? And I and I'm thinking about how a fifth grader would under or a or a first grader. And um, so, after wrestling with it and after running things by m through my metrics, uh, I put it right in the center of the exhibit. So the the best way the best way for me to confront the object is to literally confront the object. So it's 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 very pronounced as part of the exhibit. And what I found and what we found at the site is, oh, sorry, I'm hitting the, I'm hitting the jumping the shark there. What we found is that our audience, our younger audience, who is height right up to the objects, right up to the, the caricatures, uh, they almost see it as a, almost like a puppet show or a conversation. And they're embedding more anthro, anthropological uh, characteristics to the characters and, and instead of being shocked or repelled by it. So they're, they're actually intrigued by this, by this transaction or by this conversation that these two animals, these two humanized animals are, are having that are caught in this space. And so the translation for me is uh, there, there is this, there is this eternal conversation going on 
within the uh, within the confines of this of this frame. And so my my best instincts or my my response, my initial biased response was softened when I started seeing our, our young audience go right up to it and smile and be engaged with it. Uh, and so I was I was pleased. I, I leave everyone's interpretation to themselves, uh, especially when they're when they're uh, over when they're we're adult when we're all adults and we can compress all of this material. But my my heightened awareness is for our is for our audience that are younger who are processing all of this content. And to my surprise, they really they really have responded to it, and uh, that that's been very pleasant a pleasant takeaway for me in terms of this piece of specifically. Um, so Aaron, I mentioned her at, at the outset as one of our as, as one of the key artists in. Uh, she's an amazing woman, uh, teaches in, in Tinley Park and is part of the, again, there are this, this core group of artists. So she reclaims the paper, uh, the trash, the soot, the ash, and she makes new paper from it. And so you can see on the, uh, on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, it's, and so it's not paper that you write on. It's very thick and coarse. And so the paper making process takes a lot of water, a lot of pressure, a lot of uh, pulp, and uh, a lot of additives to get to that paper that, that, that we're used to working on. So, and, but it's mainly pressure. Um, in this instance, and if you look closely, you can actually see documents embedded in to that paper. So it's almost like a, a, it's almost like a very thin cardboardy. Um, we were hoping to have her do a workshop um, with the life of the exhibit hitting, hit, we're hitting the final curve here. I'm going to try and see if I can get her in to do something with us before we, uh, before we, we close the exhibit. And so the pieces that are, that are uh, displayed, so we have, a, we have a tray of, the, of her handmade paper out and uh, people can touch it and feel it. And again, that memory that existed, that was ruined by the fire has now been rebirthed in this new in this new form, as well as the, as well as the artworks that you see, and those are those are basically bits. Those are typewriter bits and typewriter pieces. Um, where the fire occurred was more ad, administrative and storage. Uh, so, so the material that was recovered from there had had outlived its date, had had been outsourced and repurposed and updated. So the material that was in there. It probably outlived its lifespan to begin with. So she's basically, and I and I asked her directly. I said, "What are what are these? What what do these represent? Um, the paper being the the base, and then the 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 objects there, and the typewriter bits put on top." I said, "Does do these represent anything?" And she said, "No. These are these are abstractions. These are just moments." And so to go to go on a on a conversation on on abstraction is its own separate um, own separate talk, but it, but to say is you know, as the viewer we bring our own set of values, and so a lot of times, so the piece in the center, we might we might see a landscape, we might see some buildings, we might you know uh, we might see a skyline. The piece on the right, on the lower right, we might see a figure, or or a, even a couple dancing. We can we can apply our own sense of interpretation to those objects, and and so what we do what we do at the museum is when we're when we're engaging on the floor with the guests, I'm interested I'm interested in this, to see what the audience sees, how they respond, and and if it layer if it adds another layer to the conversation about what the objects are and what they represent. If that makes if that makes sense. I think, I think it's looser than that. Ooh, let me see here next. All right. Aha. Bingo. So I tried Aaron. I I I I wanted to get a, a sound bit of this and I wasn't able to, to upload it on in, in time. But this is Angelica Cristal. Um, it's a sound machine. 
and it's called it's called the Nightmare Box. I'm not a fan of the title, uh, but it's a sound machine. So we talk when I talked to this artist about, and she's a musician and an and, a, and an electrician by trade. So she's a working electrician, but she's also like a punk rock musician, has a band and and travels around. And so the metal box in the center of the washboard, we see the washboard uh, that she brought in. It's sitting on a shelf a metal shelf that was recovered from the prison. Uh, but in the center is this is this metal box. And that's a first aid kit, folks. So she recovered that from the fire. Uh, and she added those, uh, those other elements on it. So it's a first aid kit that would have had, you know, Bactine and Band-Aids and Tylenol, but it was made out of metal. So it's sitting on the, uh, on the washboard. And so inside, she has a, 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 a guitar pedal release and it's hooked up to an amplifier. And so how, how I like to describe it is if, if you can imagine, and, and we've all done this, we've all poured water into a glass, into an empty wine glass, or we've, we've and with just with the vibrations with our fingers, rubbed our fingers around the edge to create that sound and that tone. It's basically the same principle. So the box, um, you drop keys on it. There, there. You can hit it with a with any of those implements. Drop change on it, and it reverb. It, there's a reverb aspect to it, and it's an echo sound, and it 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 activates pretty loudly. And the the sound that we're that she's trying to create is the sounds of of being on that prison in that site, uh, while it's empty and vacant, and it's pretty darn close. Uh, that little wire, that little wire uh, that's laying there, stringing that in between the threads there and just running it back and forth creates this almost this eerie searing sound. Um, and now that now that we're getting back to full uh, full capacity, we're going to start allowing people to activate it on their own. So it's basically a percussion instrument, and and, and so all the little pieces there are are used to tap on it. And there's, there's a little handle on the right that almost makes a creaking sound. And so the guitar pedal inside the box activates the amplifier and it's just this very striking echoing reverb. And, and um, um, if you haven't been on, on the site or if you haven't been in the prison, um, you, you'll, you'll, you'll pick up that vibe immediately. And it's, it's one of my favorite pieces in the exhibit. Um, uh, we wanted a sound element, but we couldn't have that sound reverb echoing all day. Um, Nancy and I uh, on site, we would have we would have lost our we would have lost our hearing. So it becomes a an experience for you as the guest to activate the sound, um, and it's 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 pretty stark. And 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 it, the same way, again, I think it brings you back to that moment or back to the the sense of that life that the prison had not only while it was operational but then that post life um we should talk if 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 you if, if you haven't gone on a tour i really recommend everyone does that and that might be a good field trip for your group if you haven't done it already um, um so this is the entry this is the entry piece and so two years in working with these artists uh, and, and seeing them at the site, at the prison site, at these events, I would go out there and do check-ins with them and see how the work was developing. And when I saw this piece, this is the same artist who did the, the Blues Brothers uh, television, Terry. When I saw this piece, I knew we had the show. The show was ready. Um, the, group had, the group had organically morphed uh, into, uh, there are 23 artists in this exhibit all walks of life, uh, 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 age range from like 19 to 63, um, rep representation of, of, of different eth ethnicities and, and genders. And, and for me, um, you, would never, you would never put this group of artists in the same room together. And, and I think they would, they would admit that, which is, which is part of the charm uh, um, because the, the touchstone is, the, is obviously the site and the sense of creativity, then also their point of view in terms of how they respond to the material and making something. So this sculpture is called Everyman. 
and um, it's, it's, it's copper gutters. So the copper gutters were hanging alongside the chapel or hanging, so gutters that were, that were catching the rain. Now, obviously, in any other dynamic, these would have gotten scrapped like that and cashed in for whatever, you know, the $10, $12. I don't know what the going rate of, of scrap copper is. But it was they were ready to go, and and so what what Terry what Terry did I think is just this really stunning um, confrontation, right? I think it's a comment on on corporate crime. I think it's a comment on 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 all of us. There, the fact that the that the the figure is standing there with a tie. Uh, it, it references it references to me, you know, Disney with the haunted mansion and all of that. I, I always I always try to find those those similarities, but to walk in and, and that's the first piece you see when you walk into the exhibit. Um, I think it's a really good confrontation. Just say, here's what you're about to walk into, and without the and without the physical characteristics of the human, like the face, etc. Obviously, we can we identify it as a male figure. We we with the tie we identify it as a corporate or an executive, and I, I think it's a really nice flipping of the script, uh, as you will. The piece is in, is ingenious. Um, he's got it anchored in con the the shoes are, are are embedded in concrete, uh, so it's filled so it can stand on its own, uh, because the copper is very fragile and 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 thin. But it's to to me it's 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 a stunning and the you can note the uh, the laces on the shoes or barbed wire. He also has some pennies embedded in as the as the, as the suit coat. Um, but it's it's to me again it's it's just this great opportunity to it's a great welcome, <laughs> and, and and sets the mood for the exhibit. Um, <clears throat> installation, and we talk about installations. Um, this is a ready-made installation, which means taking objects that already exist, repurposing them, reconfiguring them, and putting and reimagining them in their in their own space. Um, so it's a form of sculpture in a way, but it's not. It's there. There's no. There's no welding. There's no uh, carving. There's no. It's just taking the objects and reimagining them. And so, in this in this installation, and Sue. So, Sue Reed just worked on this, um, and, and and I I was I was working with her. I had my curatorial hat on on this as well. Um, what we wanted to imagine was, or what she wanted to imagine was, was this notion of the existence of staff being in the prison. Uh, the commode in the center, um, when you when you tour the prison. Those are the those are the shiniest objects that you saw as you walk through the halls, even through the cells. And the, the commode has some art history references to Marcel Duchamp, who was a who was a conceptual artist in the early 20th century. He uses a he uses the toilet if if, if you're familiar with uh, art history. And so there's a ref, there's reference to that. But also, what I think um, what we're finding is <laughs> based on the objects. Uh, especially with our audience, kids don't know what a Rolodex is. They don't know what an electric typewriter is. They don't know what a cell or what a what a hardwired cell phone is. And so the area that it's operating in is is the actual measured out area of what a cell would be. The sign on the upper right um, was 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 a was a literal office, and it says adjustment committee. So as you check into the uh, as you check into the prison as as you get uh, administered into the prison you walk through those turnstiles that you see and um, you're you're initiated through the adjustment committee. So imagine imagine you've 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 lost your freedom uh, for whatever reason, and you've got to acclimate to this life as a, as a as a, as a ward of the state. And and the fir your first meeting is with the adjustment committee. Pretty stark and pretty stunning. Um, we did find a lot of educational materials. Um, we I, I there are there are, obviously in the prison and there's there are more experts out there than I. There were they were growing their own food. 
It was a, it was a self-sustaining site, um, self-enclosed. The, uh, the warden lived out there through time. Uh, but this to me, in so many ways codifies for us as the viewer, uh, the prisons that we live in, <laughs> in every day and the choices that we make and how we as the viewer can see ourselves in these choices. And from this, from this entry point, it's an administrative journey. Um, and, uh, but what's, what's interesting to me, and, and again, all of this survived the fire. So you can see the rust that's embedded in, uh, th this material obviously didn't get as much scarring and as much damage. And the, Rolo the Rolodex is kind of fascinating because we didn't find any information in there, but it does have a, it does have a char on it, a, a char around the edges of it. And folks like to go in there and get their pictures taken and and that's cool and 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 i welcome that i welcome that engagement with um with the objects i think it's important because um there needs to be a takeaway um especially in today's culture where everything is is so immediate and and so the dopamine that we get from seeing ourselves on on instagram and all of these other so for me i think there's there's a lot of good takeaways from that conceptual point of view of that of that object called the adjustment committee <clears throat> so i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to roll back with one more here this is uh tony padilla who's uh uh just a, a a charming painter and and another reference to the blues brothers uh i want i wanted to keep hopefully the conversation uh light without and and to hopefully entice you folks to come out and see the exhibit which is going to be open until um july 10th here at the lockport gallery um this one it, it, and and as a curator if i'm not incorporating some painting in, into the exhibits into the exhibits that i put together i'm failing as a curator and so this this to me strikes on all bases so this is like a radiator cover and you can kind of see how it's worked by a shadow that's being cast. And that would have been from the heat of the fire. So a lot of the material that the artists were working on needed to be prepped and surfaced and taken care of before they actually got in, get, got the chance to, um, to work on it. And obviously this is, a, this is a, a, the scene from the Blues Brothers movie where John Candy uh, goes to confront the Blues Brothers and he's got every police officer in the Tri County area ready to arrest them. And, and what does he do? He's going to listen to their, them sing and he orders uh, three orange whips. I've never had an orange whip. I don't know if, if, if that's a, if that's in there, if, if anyone can push me to the direction of an orange whip. Um, I'm a lifelong Chicago and I've never had one, but, uh, but, but nonetheless. So what we hope to do, what we hope to achieve with this exhibit is to, obviously raise awareness, um, talk about all of these issues and, and really keep the conversation going about the prison, about the site and about the repurposing of the site. Um, there's, there's a lot of stakeholders involved. I think, I think we in, in, this, in this collective, even in this group, we're stakeholders. I think it's important to, to weigh in. Um, um, it's going to take a lot of muscle, a lot of willpower to see this thing evolve, see what I think it can be. There are, there are models across the country, obviously Alcatraz in San Francisco, um, and then Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia uh, is, is a prison right off the Benjamin Franklin Parkway uh, that's used more as, as, a, as, a, as a model for history. And they also do conceptual art and projects within that site as well. Um, I think there's a I think there's a greater use for the prison that I we could throw that out there for the conversation, Aaron. If people want to chime in, what they or, or ring in and what they like to hear the prison to become. But um, I'm going to give you a teaser for my next exhibit, and then we'll then we can open up the the conversation. So my next exhibit is um, opening in August, August third. It's called Fashioning Illinois. 
So it's a clothing exhibit, um, fashion created within our borders between 1820 and 1900. Uh, this, this dress is dated 1850 and it's part of our permanent collection. My colleague, Erica Holtz, who is our uh, decorative arts and history curator based in Springfield, she's done an amazing job getting all of this work together. And um, the, the exhibit is winding down in Springfield. I'm biased to our site in Lockport. If you haven't been, I think we've got the coolest uh, exhibition space around. So we want you to be able to uh, uh, come and enjoy. And as I said to you earlier, Aaron, um, if anyone's interested in, in, in if you, and if your group is interested in having Erica do a talk around this exhibit, I'm sure we can arrange that as well. Um, All right. So that's our next exhibit. How are we doing on time? Oh, we have about 10 minutes left in our hour. Um, so if anybody has some quick questions, uh, type them in the chat or I, speak up. Am I, am I back on? Is my, is my face back on? Uh, let's see. I think you have to end your share screen. Um, let me see. Stop share. Yes, we don't need to see my desktop, <laughs> my messy computer desktop. Thanks. Uh, um, I, I hope. Um, I hope everyone got a taste of what it is we're, we're, we're thinking about. And I'd be interested in, in the audience's interest in the site or because this is all content. Hi, John, I work for the museum. Orange Whip, Orange Whip. John, I work for the museum at the prison. I enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> what will happen to the exhibit when it leaves your gallery has the exhibit been to Springfield yet? I'm working on that. Thanks, Bob. Hi, how are you? I'm working on that. Um, uh, we've got COVID, we've got trucks, we've got, uh, we've got other things in the queue. Um, I can tell you that when, um, I can tell you that when, when Sue Regis had uh, Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton uh, at the site, she was completely taken with the exhibit. And, um, but I have, we have talked to, and working with Greg, we have talked to other institutions, not only within the state, but even across the borders. Because I think this exhibit has a lot of, of cachet. And, um, and again, our bias, and, and within this group, our bias is yes, let's talk about this region in these, in these frames, but, I haven't been able to. I haven't been able to nail that those dates down in Springfield yet. But I'm working. I'm working on it. The pandemic really shifted this whole world for us. Um, 